Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including Jeffrey Zilks, Kriya Artem, Tony Glass, and Bill Baggins. On this episode of DTNS, Intel's future is becoming ARM. Apple has a free sports app and a defense against our quantum future. What don't they have? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. And beneath finally sunny skies, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, uh, is that why you have such a sunny mood? Because the uh, the skies yes, are sunny. Yes, I'm getting uh, I'm getting uh, my vitamin D indirectly through the window. Through the window. So am you I. Have one of the, yeah, yeah, one of those windows that just lets in the vitamin D rays. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Sunscreen <laughs> optional. <laughs> Um, well, I'm excited uh, because we have a great live audience. Dan Crafton, who's very active on our Patreon, threatened to make the live show on Patreon this morning and then showed up in the live show. Yay, Next Dan. thing you know, R.W. Nash is going to show up live. Who knows what can happen? Uh, let's get in to the quick hits. Overnight, several users reported let's call it unpredictable behavior from chat GPT. One example that The Verge pulled from a Reddit user was a request for a biography of the Jackson family of musicians that contained the line, Schwitendli, the sparkle of Tourmar on the crest that has as much to do with the gulver of the moon paths as it shifts from follow. Now, if you said, uh, I didn't, didn't understand what that Sarah had to do with okay? the Jackson family, yeah. <laughs> well, you're not alone. A lot of other people said something seems wrong with chat GPT. At 10.40 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, OpenAI acknowledged it was investigating reports of unexpected responses from chat GPT. A few minutes later, announced it was working on a fix. The problem seems to have gone away, but OpenAI says it's still monitoring the situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing that happens when you've got a tool that just tries to predict the next word. Sometimes it doesn't predict. I mean, so sometimes well. I'm tired and I sound weird too. Yeah, yeah well, that's true. Chat GPT. Uh, AI Vertex, Google's and Nemo. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just had a little, a little glitch. Uh, Google has released Gemma 2B and 7B. These are two open source AI models that let developers use closed AI model Gemini more freely. Uh, the lightweight Gemma models are supposed to be better for smaller tasks like making your own chatbot. Uh, or doing summarizations of your own data. Google claims its Gemma models, quote, surpass significantly larger models on key benchmarks. Sort of an empty phrase that doesn't mean anything, except uh, we think ours are better. Uh, they are also capable of running directly on a developer laptop or desktop computer. Now, that's a quote that does mean something. These are local models. You can run them yourself. You don't need to put them in the crowd, cloud. Uh, you can try them out on the Kaggle uh, laptop. Uh, you can get them at Hugging Face, NVIDIA's Nemo, and Google's Vertex AI. At Nintendo Direct earlier today, the company announced that Grounded and Sentiment are Xbox exclusive games that will be exclusive no more when they arrive for the Nintendo Switch. Sentiment launches Thursday, February 22nd, Grounded on April 16th. So that's two of the four that Microsoft said would be coming. The Verge's sources think Hi-Fi Rush and Sea of Thieves are probably the other two. These could still launch on the Switch later, and any of the four could also come to the PS5. I appreciate the sentiment, but it's pentiment. Oh, <laughs> pentiment. Uh, but just, uh, but yeah, there we go. Now we, now we know. Now we know. At least two of them. I still might preview. <laughs> well, someone should make a game called Sentiment, okay? Yeah, please. For goodness sakes, Xbox. Uh, ZTE's Libero Flip for the Japanese market is going for $420 or $265 if you pre-order. Uh, that might help indications that the flip market is back, if it ever went away, uh, as the Libero Flip is priced well below the $1,000 Samsung Galaxy Z Flip and darn near as low as a clearance sale refurbished flip you could still find around the net if you wanted to look for it on a used market. Libero Flip has a Qualcomm Snapdragon 7 series chip inside and a 6.9 inch 2790 by 1188 foldable OLED panel, slightly larger than the Samsung Flip. It includes a 50 megapixel main camera, two megapixel depth camera, 16 megapixel selfie in the front, runs Android 13 with six gigs of RAM, 128 gigs storage, Wi-Fi 6, a Bluetooth 5.2, charges up to 33 watts over its USB-C port. But I think most importantly, its front cover screen is circular. So it looks like a little compact. 
The Wall Street Journal sources say that Reddit may set aside a chunk of shares in its upcoming IPO for 75,000 of its most active users, sort of a thank you for being a friend. But as Mastodon user uh, Carnage for Life points out, I was initially impressed because I thought they were gifting them shares. However, an opportunity to buy Reddit shares at a $5 billion valuation, hoping that it goes higher, is more of a gamble than a perk. Oh, that's just true of every IPO, though, right? Every IPO, you, they don't give away the shares. <laughs> that's that's not how IPOs work. But they limit who gets to buy them at the initial price. The idea being that IPOs generally go up. I so, mean, hey, yeah, you know, if you're if you're a diehard Reddit user and you're part of the seventy five thousand, this might be might be a cool perk. Might be. Yeah. If you wanted to buy the IPO, it's a cool perk. If you're like, no, I never wanted to to buy stock in Reddit, then no, it's probably not that cool of a perk. I get that. <laughs> Well, back in 2021, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger promised Intel's customers and investors five nodes in four years, but the plan to go all in on fabs and become a top-to-bottom foundry service for the whole world to use. Now that roadmap is is seeing some light with Intel's first EUV-based node, Intel 4, available in the market today, and its high-volume counterpart, Intel 3, also ready. Intel is also ready in its Gate All Around or GAAFET ribbon FET for 2024 and next year, 2025. Today, Intel's Foundry Group has uh, formerly become Foundry Group, used to be called Intel Foundry Services, and held its first conference, Direct Connect. Direct Connect is Intel's first chance to talk at length about the five nodes goal and where the company's going forward. Direct Connect is also Intel's chance to update folks on, you know, what comes after those first five notes. Intel Foundry wants to expand capacity, customers, tooling. That's obvious. You know, that uh, company wants to make money. And now the group is looking toward a slate of even more advanced nodes, but also packaging technologies that would be necessary to back all that up. Now, Roger, you had mentioned in our pre-show meeting that Intel didn't exactly deliver on the promise from three years ago, timing wise, but, but they're getting there. What stood out to you about how far Intel has come? I think two things stood out. One is that they really do have a plan to become a top to bottom foundry. That means we, they just don't, uh, they, they, they're not just going to be a fabricator or a foundry to make, make other people's designs. They will, you, 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 you work, they'll work with the client and develop their own chips uh, designs as well as uh, testing them and then producing them, uh, and it, it doesn't sound like much on the f- f- uh, face of it. But you have to understand that Intel's foundries have historically just been used internally. That means they now to ha- they now need to have the process and the tooling to have a variety of potential clientele come through the door and say, "We want this chip designed and made and on this uh, uh, process node. Can you do it?" Uh, so that is an entirely different set of uh, uh, requirements because now it's no like, hey, can I borrow this from from this foundry because we need it for this chip because it's you know in the same company. Now you have to be a little more um, well oiled, as it were, uh, to be kind of a, a, a clientele facing operation. The other thing is that they're the the EU, EUV or the extreme uh, UV lithography machine that they got is uh, the new numerical aperture, which means it's a larger aperture. And effectively, what it means is they can produce the smaller node process uh, in a shorter amount of time. And it's a machine that TSMC itself has passed on because they're fine with their current process and they can effectively move to the next generation without too many tweaks. But for Intel, this could po- possibly be their way to leapfrog TSMC into the next generation of chips. Um, Still too early to say if that actually will happen, but uh, at least based on their flow chart that they they gave, uh, it looks like they're aiming for that. Yeah, the, the, I think Intel's doing better than a lot of people expected, even though they're running behind their own timeline. Uh, Gelsinger is committed. I think that's the important point here. He's not doing this halfway. He's not saying, hey, uh, we'd, we'd like to make chips for other people, but really we want to make all our money on our own chips. So we'll begrudgingly make chips for other people, which is, I think, what a lot of people thought. 
They they thought the Intel Foundry would sort of compete with TSMC, and that's that. And what you're saying, Roger, is they're competing with ARM too. They're like, hey, we can design a chip for you. You you want to come to us with the design? Great, we'll build it for you. We'll build it faster than TSMC is what they'll tell you. Uh, but they'll also design. They'll also do packaging. Uh, that is smart. Gelsinger is not doing this halfway. He's like, if we're going to be a foundry, let's be a foundry from top to bottom. And it's it's interesting because I think a very few companies have done that. I think IBM has done that in the past with their uh, Power PC, and they developed and uh, uh, Fab the cell processor used in the PS3. Um, but it is it is a very capital intensive goal. It's not cheap. Uh, the fact that they are sticking to their guns and Gelsinger is effectively emphatically saying this is where we're going to be. 2025 is kind of the, the benchmark year where you're going to see if all these promises that they've they've put out uh, come yeah. to fruition. And uh, it's something they need to be patient with if they want to supplement and eventually surpass the in-house Intel chips, x86 isn't going to last forever. That That's what Gelsinger is identifying here. And he needs to get the foundry business in place before that happens and hopefully come up with new designs that, that keep Intel chips uh, a, a, as a going concern as well. I don't think they're going to abandon making their own chips, uh, but they know that this is a much more competitive market than they used to be when they when the old Wintel dominance just you know, shoved everything else out the door. A Bloomberg reporting Microsoft has contracted Intel to make its chips. Those are the kinds of big contracts that Intel's foundry is going to need to have to make it successful. So if that ends up uh, being as Bloomberg reported, and Bloomberg's pretty good with this stuff, uh, it's a good sign that Gelsinger is on the right track. A couple of Apple stories to talk about. First, sports. On Wednesday, Apple <laughs> announced Sarah a sports. <laughs> <laughs> now with sports. A free standalone app called Apple Sports. Uh, very clever. Thank you, Apple. Uh, sharing scores and stats to your iOS device. This is not unlike a Yahoo Sports or you know some some other uh, sports app that you might have already been using for some time. It's also designed to drive viewers to the Apple TV app to watch those live sports, which does include now Major League Soccer matches. Apple has a 10-year deal through Apple TV's MLS Season Pass subscription add-on. Apple Sports includes a Watch on Apple TV button for each game. Now, it's not always going to apply, but if it does, then you can open up your Apple TV app to the service that's live streaming the event and where you can subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. So it's sort of a, it's a portal. It's a portal to sports. Apple Sports is in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. app stores for now, with support for English and French and Spanish where it is available. It's a sportal. It's a sportal. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a sports portal. I love this and hate it. Why um, do you hate which, it? <laughs> well, should I start? Yeah. Would you like me to start with the love yeah, or start the, with bad the Bad news hate? first, always. Bad news yeah. first. Uh, why isn't this cross-platform? Well, I know why, because it's Apple. But I want this cross-platform. I don't want to have to only have this on my iOS device. I want it on the web. I want it on Android. I'll probably be able to get it on the web at some point, maybe, or at least on an app on my Mac. But I mm -hmm. doubt I'll ever be able to get it on Android. Um I also don't like that it's just Apple TV, although I want to see how this works in practice because Apple TV has add-on channels. So maybe it'll also have like Paramount Plus Sports. Maybe it'll even have Peacock or ESPN Plus or eventually ESPN uh, Sports because that would be, I think, a better deal for Apple is to say, watch all your sports through Apple TV's app, whether it's Apple provided sports or not, and use the Apple Sports app to launch them. I think that would be super compelling. So those are the things I don't like is that it seems more limited and very Apple-y. The thing I love about it, though, is I've wanted a simple sports score app forever. Uh, ESPN complicates things. It tries to give me things I don't want, uh, or at least things I don't want when I'm just looking for the scores. Uh, it tries to guess what I want, and it doesn't guess very well. Yahoo Sports is old, uh, and it's fine. But it is again, it's trying to, to show me things that it wants to show me. Apple is like, no, we know you just you just want to follow your teams or your leagues and your sports here. We made it made it simple and made it easy. That's the thing I love about it. Uh, yeah, I I uh, installed the app this morning. Um, you know, works as advertised. I was like, here are my favorite teams. You tell me about those favorite teams. And uh, I think in uh, well, in theory, maybe not in execution at this point. You know, we're still crawling toward a world where I'd be like, I would like to watch this game. 
I've heard it starts in 15 minutes. No idea what platform it's on, what channel, don't know. Maybe Apple Sports will just help me get there. Yeah, let me just tap the button. Tap the button and and take take me there. Maybe I have to pay. I don't know. I mean, just help me do that instead of Googling like, on what channel are the Warriors playing? Right, because Apple has all of the apps that play the sports, right? They have yeah. the, uh, the the apps for all the streaming services, even apps for all the cable services out there. If you could just tap the button that says, oh, this is playing here. Uh, we geolocated you, so we know this is the service that has it in your market. Yeah. Uh, and if you if you subscribe, we'll just launch you into that app. And if you don't, then we'll give you the option of like, oh, if you want to watch it, you could subscribe to these different services. That would be great. I would love it if they did that. I mean, there there are there are Apple apps that actually do this quite well already, not for sports, but for example, you know, I talk about my love for Plex, you know, I, you know, if something's on the media server that I'm that, that I have access to, great. But um, if I don't have access, it goes, okay, uh, Apple TV Plus has this and, you know, here's what you would pay. Well, I have Apple TV Plus, so that doesn't really matter. But, you know, you might not. But yeah, or, whether you, you do know, or not, or, it'll tell you, you where know, to get it. Right. On Hulu yeah. or on Netflix or Apple, you know, the Apple TV. Else. Apple TV does the same thing. Like the actual device, the Apple TV does the yeah. same thing. And it even has the the sports. The, the teams that I follow on the Apple TV app were pre-populated in the Apple Sports app when I launched it. So it does a pretty good job of telling me like, oh, the Illinois basketball team is playing in Apple TV. Uh, So it's halfway there. Just put it in the sports app, right? Which I don't know, maybe they will. I haven't really had it long enough to be able to test if that's the case or not, but they're not showing me a way to watch the Illinois game. The, the, um, the album art for the app is a soccer field. I think Apple is going hard in on MLS right now, seeing where it sticks and hopefully opening it up after that. Yeah, I think that is probably true. Uh, well, the other thing we didn't talk about in regard to sports is AI deciding for you what sports you want to watch. Uh, if you want to stay up to date in the fast moving world of artificial intelligence, you cannot miss AI named this show. Uh, each week, Tristan Jutra and Teja Custody cut through the hype. They cut through the doomsaying uh, and just talk about the things that are important to know about artificial intelligence and generative models and deep learning and machine learning and LLMs and all of that. Catch it at AINamedThisShow.com. In the next OS software updates for phones, tablets, watches, and Macs, another Apple story. Yes, we are doing it. Apple will add a new cryptographic protocol to its messaging service, iMessage, called PQ3. The new protocol is designed to be resistant to future attacks from quantum computers. Now, Tom, people might say, well, I mean, isn't encryption just resistant to all sorts of attacks? Why would quantum computers be particularly problematic? Yeah, and we don't need to worry about quantum computers this minute. Uh, They're making slow progress, but they are making progress. And one of the things that quantum computers are good at is breaking encryption. Right now, they're not powerful enough to practically break current encryption, but they're on their way. Uh, If you want to break a, a key, right, an encryption key, a classical computer has to run through all the possible combinations. Now, classical computers can break through combinations very fast, but if you make that key long enough, if you make the factors of the encryption long enough, the time it would take to crack a key can become impractically long. Uh, so it could be like, yeah, you can run through all the possibilities <laughs> you, you in will not be alive thousand years. Get- yeah, exactly. And then that's considered secure. Like, oh, a hundred thousand years from now, if someone finally does crack your key, you probably won't care. Quantum computers, on the other hand, work a different way than classical computers. One of the things they can do is make multiple attempts at once. Uh, but there's other ways that they can speed up the process and look at current encryption and break it fast. They could break it in a month. They could break it in a week. You know, eventually they might be able to break it in minutes. Uh, Here's why you need to worry about that now. Bad actors are gathering your encrypted data and storage is cheap. 
so they can keep your encrypted data around until the time that quantum computers become practical to use to break encryption. Now, for most of this, maybe not that big of a deal, but, you know, people in sensitive situations, uh, people who are very concerned about privacy are, are going to be vulnerable to someone saying, well, I got your encrypted data and eventually I'll be able to crack it. So to get ahead of the game, Apple is updating its encryption so that even if they steal your encrypted messaging data, it will be resistant to quantum computing. It will have strong enough encryption that even a quantum computer shouldn't be able to break it. Now, you might say, okay, well, Apple is like really, really worried about quantum computers, but uh, not the only company doing this, right? No. If Again, these are things that the very security-minded, uh, people in governments, people in militaries, people in journalism, people in sensitive situations worry mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are the kinds of people that use apps like Signal. Signal recently added quantum resistance to its encryption protocol, too. Now, Apple created its own uh, way of ranking their encryption and it turns out theirs is the best. <laughs> what a surprise, eh, Sarah? Um, mm. But there's there's actually a backing to that. Uh, Apple ranks its encryption at level one. It ranks Signal's quantum resistance at level two. Uh, and Apple's PQ3 at level three. So the current encryption is level one. That's one that's probably not going to be resistant. Signal's is at level two. It's pretty quantum resistant, but Apple's is at level three, the most quantum resistant. Uh, and if you're into this, Apple has a really well done post that goes into how they're using, you know, uh, diffy cues and, and elliptic curves and, and everything to, to make PQ3. But the short version is level two adds quantum resistance to the creation of the key. But if that key were to be compromised, then they could get your messages. What Apple's doing is like going above and beyond and changing up the keys so that even if they crack the key creation process, the ongoing messages wouldn't then be automatically decrypted. So that keeps the key from getting cracked. Um, it, it protects your messages even if somehow the key creation got cracked. Yeah. Okay. So that was going to be my question is... How is Apple testing this to mm. feel confident in saying we're the best messages or I messages where you send those messages? Yeah, normally you, you'd uh, you'd run it through some crackers, right? If it was classical computing, and I don't mean Ritz, I, I mean like you would you would try to brute force it and say like ah, see, it can't be brute forced. We don't have quantum computers that can do this yet. So there isn't a computer you can try to break it with. So we really don't know how good this encryption is at resisting quantum computers, but Apple says its protocol was assessed by an unnamed third-party security company. Feel better if they named it, but okay. And this one I feel pretty good about, two groups of academics who have written papers about the theory and the math behind it saying, you know, to the best of our knowledge, this is really secure. Obviously, there's no way of knowing until you actually get quantum computers that can test it. But given everything we know, this this is your best chance at quantum resistance. So I that mean, that makes me feel pretty good about it too. I think there's probably a couple of people out there being like, okay, so a bad actor who's trying to break into you know you know any platform system, are they all going to have access to quantum computers? I mean, how easy will these be to come by in the future? Well, well, the idea is that uh, you don't know, so you might. And what Tom was saying, since storage is Get cheap, ahead of it. it's 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 a hedge. Of, it's a it's it's hedging their bets. Yeah, it's the um, security game of yeah. like it's not how it's not how likely the attack is. It's how how much how close to zero do you want to get the possibility yeah. of your data being uncovered? And remember, like most crime is a crime of opportunity. So if you can save, if you if you have an opportunity, you're just going to save it uh, for that day when it does come around. What's interesting is on the testing. I mean, most testing with with quantum computing, unless you actually have a quantum machine, but even if you did, you couldn't really do this. You you test it against an idealized quantum computer model, and you would go through a bunch of a uh, 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 theorized hypothetical, you know. Uh, 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 scenarios to see whether or not uh, it, it stands up. My question, though, is this really a game changer that Apple's presenting, or is this attempt to kind of ga garner mind share ahead of its mm. competitors, saying like, hey, we're taking security to the next level. So when you think security, it's going to have an Apple uh, uh, embossed on front of it. 
I think I'd answer yes. The answer to both of those is yes. This is a real attempt at real security from from everything I can tell. And and I will bow to people who know more about security than I do if they they find something weak about it. But it seems like it's an honest uh, defense against quantum resistance. It's not like Apple's the only one doing it. Signal's doing it. There are other security minded organizations doing it. So it's not it's not fluff. Uh but also they want to use it to get mind share. Like they don't need to do this. This is not a practical thing for the majority of their audience, but I think they want, like you said, people to think that Apple logo means security. I don't have a problem with that when they back it up with actual security, which appears to be what they're doing here. And uh, just for clarification, you don't actually need a quantum computer to use any of this. This is all done on classical computers. Ah, good it's point. it's yeah. rather that it's the encryption is done on classical yeah. computers. It would be the attacker that would have to use the quantum computer. Good point. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I can't well, wait until it comes to Android. Okay. And also, you don't need to do anything. This is just coming in an update, right? You're you're just going to get it. And it's going to happen. You don't need to turn it on. Or I mean, I mean can you I imagine Apple being Apple. like, for $5 a month? <laughs> oh, <laughs> We'll protect your privacy for just for an extra 5 Well, you know, I say that, and uh, let's just hope not. All right, let's check out the mailbag. So we got a, a bunch of good responses uh, to our conversation with Lamar Wilson, who was our guest yesterday on the show, about him liking the form factor of the iPad mini. Rusty, who lives in Huntsville, Alabama, hi Rusty, says, I've been a happy Android user since my first gen iPhone would not allow me to download podcasts over my required AT&T unlimited data plan. But then I decided to get my pilot's license. I decided ForeFlight was the best electronic flight bag, EFB, for me. ForeFlight is only available on Apple products, so I succumbed back to Apple for a single iPad. The iPad mini is the perfect form factor for flying small aircraft. You can clamp it onto a mount on the yoke, just small enough to read gauges around it while being large enough to read misapproached procedures. I've seen other pilots fly with larger iPads, but they're usually placed in inconvenient places. Yeah, I, I'd say that Lamar's discussion of why he went back to the iPad mini has engendered the most response uh, of any discussion we've had in, in months. Uh, Brian wrote in and said, mini fan here, same as other comments as to the size. I love the size of the Kindle, which the mini is similar, fits into pockets, so easy to take with. I use it a lot for reading and PDFs. Also, card games work very well on that size. I also have an iPhone SE because I like my phones smaller, so the mini works well as the bigger screen. And David wrote in and said, I became an iPad mini fan when recording my son's high school basketball games from the bleachers. I didn't enjoy viewing the games by squinting at my iPhone Pro Max screen, and I had a hard time following the ball in action. But sizing up to the mini was just right. Fit on my tripod, wasn't overly intrusive or obnoxious to those sitting behind or around me. And the screen was big enough that I could get immersed in the action, not have to constantly glance over to see where the ball went. I also found it to be an excellent fit for seatback movie watching on planes. In its folding case, it'll slide into the brochure slot, be at eye level, I don't have to look down like I do with a laptop, and leaving the tray top space available for other things. That's one of the more interesting uh, uses of this is the the basketball game. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, th these are just a few of the many, many responses we got. And every one of them was like, yep, me too. Like the mini. Here's why. So I thought that was that was really yeah, fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's always good to strike a chord and hear yeah. what everyone else is thinking. Indeed. Uh, patrons, stick around for the extended show. The fun doesn't end here. Good day, Internet. Uh, yesterday on Good Day Internet, uh, we talked about flying to Tokyo for lunch. Uh, could you go to Tokyo for lunch? Well, one DTNS listener says, don't laugh too quick. The answer is yes. Plus, our theories on why ChatGPT lost its mind. We'll talk about all that and more. And that person doesn't actually live in Tokyo, by the way. It's a great no. story. You got you to hang around for this. But just a reminder, you can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back again doing it all tomorrow, talking about Sora. That's the text-to-video generating AI from OpenAI with Charlotte Henry joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>